So uh, I guess we can start. Yeah. Good day to all of you. Good morning to you if you are in Asia or Southeast Asia. So my name is uh, Chikit Lui. I'm from the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Welcome to the FC webinar series. FC stands for Asia Pacific Society for Computers in Education. This particular session is organized by the special interest group SIC in CT STEM. CT STEM stands for Computational Thinking and STEM Education. In this SIC, we are looking for speakers for, for this webinar, and the name of Professor Gautam Biswas comes to mind given his prominent work in STEM plus C. And so we invited him and he has graciously accepted to give this talk. So uh, some things to take note of in this session, uh, remember to use the Q&A function, your questions, and uh, do stay back uh, at the end, uh, just to do the survey, give us some feedback so that you can improve uh, future webinar offerings. But uh, let me, let me uh, uh, introduce Professor Gautam Biswas. Uh, Professor Biswas is a Cornelius Vanderbilt Professor of Engineering, a Professor of Computer Science and Engineering in the CS Department, and a Senior Research Scientist at the Institute for Software Integrated Systems at Vanderbilt University, US. He conducts research in intelligent systems with primary interest in modeling and simulation, analysis of complex com embedded systems, data mining, and open-ended learning environments for STEM disciplines. Professor Biswas is a life member of the IEEE, Asia Pacific Society for Computers in Education, and the Pronostics and Health Management Society. So let us invite Professor Biswas to give us uh, a talk on open-ended learning environments supporting STEM plus C learning. Professor Biswas, please. Thank you very much, Chiket, Longshang, and others for giving me an opportunity to present my work. Let me try to share my screen. And we can get started. So I think this is the right screen. Is this the right screen, uh, Chiket, or? Uh, yes. You're only seeing my slides, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'll get started. So thank you very much everyone for attending the talk. Uh, what I will uh, talk about today is the work that we have been doing in my lab on what we call our open-ended learning environments to support a STEM plus C learning. So I have a number of uh, uh, students and uh, researchers who work with me in my lab. Uh, so I have uh, uh, highlighted some of them, Ningyu Shang and now Nicole Hutchins, who have primarily worked on the done work on what I'm going to present today. Navid Mama, the research engineer in our group, has been responsible for developing some of our systems. And then amongst a lot of other collaborators that I have, uh, one of my former students, Chatabdi Basu, and Jenny Chu from Virginia, and Kevin Michael Haney from Digital Promise have been close collaborators on the work that I'm going to present today. Uh, so uh, very quickly, uh, I, I have been working on a number of projects that are related to computer-based learning environments to support uh, various kinds of STEM learning, the original system uh, that uh, we developed with Dan Schwartz, uh, John Bransford and others was the Betty's Brain System where students learn by teaching uh, a computer agent, and this was mostly focused on ca causal modeling for scientific applications. Then more recently, I've been working on, uh, uh, focused very much on STEM plus C projects. So the original project was a, uh, a system called C2STEM, collaborative uh, computational STEM learning environment, which uh, I worked with a number of others on, and it, it evolved from a system called computational thinking using simulation and modeling that we had worked on before. 
But what I will be presenting today is uh, an, ex uh, an extension of what we have been doing in C2STEM. SPICE uh, stands for Science Projects in, in Integrating Computing and Engineering. So the focus of this work is going to be very much on integrating science and engineering in middle school classrooms, but using computation or computational thinking as, as a basis for this integration. So very quickly, uh, the outline for my talk, I'm going to very, uh, I'm, I'm going to very briefly present uh, my ideas of what I consider an open-ended learning environment to be. And then I will uh, talk uh, in more detail about the SPICE system or the SPICE curriculum. Uh, and uh, it's an NGSS aligned water runoff uh, curriculum. It's, it's a middle school uh, a curriculum topic in earth sciences. And uh, it, the, the way we've developed the system, we've integrated a lot of different activities that starts from hands-on activities where students conduct small experiments, to look at conceptual modeling and where they bring in a start from the real world and try to model phenomena they see in the real world, then move on to computational modeling where they use a block structured uh, programming language to build a computational model of this water runoff phenomenon, and then they use that model to do engineering design. And uh, what I'm going to show you is, uh, you know, studies we've run and the data we've collected, and how that shows the how synergistic learning between science, engineering, and computational thinking occurs. And and at the end, I'll uh, present some conclusions and discussions for future uh, and uh, and directions for future work. Uh, I'm going backwards. Yeah. So very quickly, let me talk about uh, uh, open-ended learning environments. So these are basically environments which are which are based on constructivist theories. So the idea here is you get students to learn by constructing, uh, you know, a solution to a particular problem. And in our case, a lot, lot of the initial construction has to do with modeling a science phenomenon. So uh, in, in this case, uh, students are learning by modeling and, and by using ideas from computation and computational thinking, we are focusing on them building computational models of systems. And this is a very open-ended task because in a sense, their goals are fixed. They have to build a correct model of a scientific phenomenon, but we don't tell them how to go about building it. We provide them with a set of tools that they have to figure out how to combine and use to effectively construct their model. And, and because it's open-ended, it, pro uh, it promotes exploration, reflection. And uh, we find that in general, because students have, have been given this independence and freedom to explore, they are more engaged in the tasks that they work on. And, and this therefore provides a, a, an opportunity for them to develop these cognitive and metacognitive strategies that they can uh, then transfer to other learning situations. So in other words, uh, uh, our learning environments that we have constructed provide a context and a set of tools for, for building models and solving problems. And then the, the students go about using their own approaches uh, to solve the problem. Of course, we provide them feedback in terms of the correctness of their model. Uh, say, for example, if they're building a simulation model, they can simulate that model and figure out uh, you know, if, if there are errors in the model. In other cases, like in Betty's brain, they can take a, they can ask the agent to take a quiz and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the number of answers the, the agent Betty gets right or wrong helps them then determine where they, where they have made errors in their particular model. Now, it turns out that uh, these kind of open-ended learning environments, while they engage the students, also provide significant challenges to, to novice learners, especially those who do come in with uh, insufficient prior knowledge. Uh, it, the, the system makes high demands on them because they have to uh, you know, figure out how to use the uh, various tools that we provide them, how to use them effectively to, to solve problems. So for example, if they're building a simulation model, they have to understand the blocks they're dragging and dropping onto the screen and connecting 
uh, them to build a model, but then when they run a simulation and, and say the simulation does not produce the results that they're expecting, they have to then figure out where they made the error in building their model and then try to correct it. And uh, this is not an easy task for students, so they often uh, uh, you know, uh, struggle. And uh, thus far, we, we have often uh, provided guidance as, as they're working on these models, but, current, but in our current work, we are building, uh, say, animated agents or embodied agents who, who converse with the students and help them overcome their difficulties. And the kind of difficulties we find are, are, are actually lack of metacognitive strategies. So often their ability to judge how to pro proceed with uh, constructing a solution to a problem is not well developed. As I said earlier, if they lack prior knowledge, it's hard for them to figure out how to use these tools uh, effectively. And then typically when you're working in these more complex environments, it requires you to monitor how you're progressing and then try to adjust if, if you don't seem to be prog progressing well. So this idea of monitoring and reflection often is not well developed in novice students. And, and of course, they often underestimate their efforts. They think it's going to be much easier than it turns out to be. And therefore, it often, you know, it, at times it results in them getting frustrated and then disengaging from their tasks. So, so we've observed all this in a number of studies that we've run, and uh, not that we've solved all these problems, but we are working to the, towards how to address them. So, so this is a general overview, and, and uh, you know, why sort of we find open-ended learning environments to be very effective in helping students learn. So uh, uh, just to move on and talk a little bit about our system. So our first system was an open-ended learning environment, as, I, uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, called C2STEM. And uh, the first curriculum we developed here was uh, a full one semester curriculum where students learned kinematics and mechanics in, in a 10th grade advanced physics class. So you can see it, it's probably uh, not so easy to see. So there's a block structured uh, modeling language. Now, one of the key uh, you know, uh, features of, of the work that we do is that these blocks are not pure computational blocks. If you're able to see them in a little more detail, you'll see that because students are solving a kinematics problem, the blocks relate to variables like position, velocity, acceleration, et cetera. So, so therefore, though the student is uh, building a program by dragging and dropping these blocks on the screen to construct a model, uh, because, because the, the blocks represent physics concepts or kinematic concepts and relations, right? they're, they're constructing relations between variables to, to build the model, uh, they feel that they are working more in science than pure computation. And as you can see, the, you know, as they construct their model, they can, they can simulate that model, the model. This particular one is, is a truck that starts from rest, speeds up to the speed limit, cruises for a while, and then has to slow down and come to a stop at a, at a stop sign. And so, so they can build this model in little parts, test it out. One of the difficulties they have is they can speed up uh, the, the truck, but they find it difficult to figure out how to slow it down when, when they have to start de decelerating the truck. And so then they can, uh, you know, they can generate plots or look at the data generated by the simulation and try and figure out, uh, you know, why the pro their uh, particular model is not working and then fix it. And and this particular curriculum goes, starts with, uh, say, one one D accelerated motion goes on to, you know, two D motion with constant velocity. So they learn the concept of vectors and how to combine say velocities and uh, in, in the X and Y direction. And then it goes on to 2D accelerated motion, which here is a drone dropping packages from the air. And because the drone is traveling with a, a constant velocity in, in the X direction, the, the package then takes a pa parabolic trajectory when it falls. So the students have to figure out when to release the package so that it falls on a particular target. And, and the other figure, uh, the other image you see here is, uh, is the high school physics teacher using the, the simulation environment to explain this motion of the, of the package as it falls 
And uh, again, you may not be able to see very well, but on the right, he's written out the equations. And then here he's explaining to, uh, by, the, the, by the trajectory, he's relating it back to the equations of motion that, that sort of govern this trajectory. And students find that initially they find it difficult because traditional physics, they're just used to learning equations and applying those equations to solve problems. But in this case, they have to translate those equations into computational blocks to implement the simulation model. So initially they find it difficult, but as they figure this out, you know, uh, things become much more intuitive because after all, when, when you're solving these kind of problems, you're actually solving integration problems, but you've simplified the integration problem by discretizing the time steps. So if students find it much more in intuitive and easier to learn as, they, as has been pointed out by a number of other researchers. So uh, let me then move on to the, to, uh, discussing the SPICE uh, curriculum. So as I mentioned, it's science, science projects, integrating computation and engineering. Uh, so basically the idea here, as I mentioned earlier on, was yeah, students learn by building models of scientific processes, but the idea here is to link science and engineering. So if once they've built a model of a scientific process, can they, can they apply that model to solve an engineering problem? And that engineering problem could be anything in our case, if they're designing a playground to, you know, that, uh, minimum, that uses materials to minimize flooding or runoff. Uh, say they're, they're redesigning their schoolyard and they have a certain budget under which they have to work. And then they have to meet other constraints like accessibility constraints there so that uh, students who are handicapped right, are not uh, prevented from using at least some parts of the playground. So, so that's, that's the overall idea. Uh, and uh, what, what we, the way we designed the curriculum is we followed the next generation science standards that have been laid down in the United States and a number of science curricula follow that. And, uh, uh, basically, uh, this was the big question we were trying to answer. Yeah, you know, people talk a lot about integrating science and engineering. There's been some work done in that area, but can we use, uh, say, computational or computing structures right, to better link science and engineering? And of course, you know, uh, it should be quite happy from what I've been talking about thus far that we are going to do it by creating computational models of scientific processes and then use those computational models to solve an engineering design problem. So in a, in a little more detail, you can, uh, you know, you can look at, uh, for example, the NGSS standards that we adopted for this water runoff curriculum. So we looked at uh, the NGSS standards for engineering problem solving in middle schools. It, it involved concepts like you know, learning how to define and uh, delimit problems, design, refine, optimize solutions, and so on and so forth. And in, in order to come up with designs, you have to do fair tests to make sure you did not violate constraints, as well as then conduct tests to see, compare solutions and decide which one was better than the other. Similarly, in science, we were, as I mentioned earlier, we're dealing with earth sciences and primarily the phenomena of uh, urban uh, water runoff, which is something that's been happening a lot in urban areas in the United States, partly because of climate change and there being more rain, partly because of urbanization. So more and more of the natural ground uh, is being re replaced by concrete, which, uh, you know, where, where, where the water does not seep through, uh, with, you know, concrete, which does not absorb the water well. And so there's more flooding and more runoff in, in, in uh, urban areas. And it particularly affects kids, so they are very conscious of it. So whenever there's heavy rainfall, you know, they're not, they're not able to go out and play in the playground during recess. And so it does affect them. And, you know, they, they, they look upon this as a significant problem that they wanted to address. So, so that interest was created, created with them. And then, of course, uh, we use computational modeling uh, Right, that uh, so we, we follow the K-12 standards for computation, and the idea is to get them familiar with the concept of variables, with conditional structures, 
and and then be able to put them together to construct a, a, a model. And uh, let me now go through and show you how we did that. So as I mentioned earlier, we followed these NGS, uh, the NGSS standards that are laid down and NGSS standards involve learning the, the primary concepts in a particular topic, like looking at practices. So scientific modeling is a practice, like computational modeling is a practice. And, and then, of course, uh, look, so you look at core ideas, practices, as well as cross-cutting concepts. And, and all of the, most of the cross-cutting concepts you are looking at was from, say, fun, under, understanding fundamental relations to, to, to problem solving. In this case, the problem solving was specific in the engineering design. So they went through the sequence in which they started with uh, uh, scientific investigations where they actually ran some experiments and went, went out and poured water in, over different materials and uh, tried to make notes of you know how much was absorbed and how much was left on the surface etc they came back and then tried to convert those ideas into some kind of a conceptual model so we're gradually then moving from what they could see in the real world to to how they might model it and once they had understood the phenomena uh, conceptually, then we got them to try and convert it into an executable computational model. And then once they had that execution, uh, executable computational model, then they went through an engineering design process, which is designing a playground. And I'll, I'll give you more details about it soon. So this, this slide uh, is sort of is somewhat repetitive because I've already talked about most of these concepts, but the, the curriculum was designed in an evidence-centered way with, uh, you know, the, our uh, collaborators at SRI uh, are, are very much into evidence-centered design and of, of uh, curriculum and assessments. Uh, and of course, I already mentioned that what we're working towards is integrating science and engineering anchored by computational thinking and I've already talked about the sequence that we go through. So another interesting thing about this is that in each one of these, they're dealing with different uh, representations, but uh, uh, so, so in, in a sense, it's a, it's a, that we are using multiple representations to convey these ideas. And people have always said that the, that uh, that can that can create computational load on the students, but in our work we found that if these representations are linked, they they uh, they prove to be quite beneficial in helping the students understand the primary concepts. And and then of course uh, the other thing I mentioned briefly earlier is that, and you'll see it in more detail when you see a more uh, a bigger picture, is that our computational blocks are actually all designed using a domain specific language. So I, I talked about uh, the computational blocks for physics. In this case, they will be very earth science oriented. So you see that. And then, of course, we want the computational models to be executable. In other words, they're like simulations. And so the, by, by doing that, they support science inquiry. So they, as they're building the models, they, they, they think about you know, various possibilities, they explore different ideas. Uh, and, and that helps them understand the basic scientific concepts better as they're putting together this model. So here, here is a, 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 a sort of an illustration of the playground design challenge. So uh, this was originally developed for uh, a school in Virginia, Walker Middle School, where they do actually next to the school have this open ground and, and it's slightly sloping, so on, on heavy rainfall, it, it would either flood or students could see there was a lot of runoff into the nearby neighborhoods or into streams. And uh, you know they, they have been taught that these runoff, especially because you know we use chemical fertilizers, etc., can often uh, you know often uh, transport pollutants to other areas. So the idea was, how could you redesign the playground? Right, uh, so as to minimize this kind of runoff or, or uh, water logging on this field. And then of course we had to simplify it for them. So we divided the, the, their, the whole play area that they were re redesigning into a grid four by four grid. Now you could see that some of the, some of the space spots are occupied by buildings. Obviously they could not redesign those parts, 
But in the other ones, they had a choice of uh, six different materials, right? Like concrete, uh, you know, permeable concrete, which people have started using a lot nowadays, grass or artificial turf, you know, wood chips or cold rubber. Each one of these has, has a di different permeability, so uh, a different absorption rate. Uh, and of course, they cost differently too. So here was the trade-off. Yeah, you could try to minimize runoff by using the, the materials that had the most absorption capability, but they were also more expensive. And, and the third criteria they had to meet, as I, as I mentioned earlier, was they had to meet accessibility criteria. So the, the ultimate goal was to figure out how to populate. There were other constraints too. For example, the play, play area had to include a basketball court, so they could only include, uh, include uh, use some certain materials for the basketball court. They had to have a soccer field or a football field, and then they had to have a play area with swings, et cetera. And then some others were open-ended, so they could use them as they like. So, so that this was the design problem that they were given. So moving on, so I'll, I'll sort of very quickly describe each one of the activities. So I, as I mentioned earlier, they started with hands-on activities. And here you can see the sixth grade students out by their, you know, in the front of the school. They, they were testing various things, like they were pouring water onto the pavement and seeing what happened versus pouring it onto grass. And then, of course, uh, nearby, uh, they had some, uh, you know, these uh, flower beds which which had wood chips on them, so they poured water over that. So, so they they tried various things. They worked in small groups, and as you can see, then they were their teachers asked them to make observations from the experiments that they had conducted. So this is this is the real world sort of experience that they got, and then they came back into into the classroom, and uh, initially they built this uh, this conceptual model. Uh, and it started with a, with a, uh, you know, them having a pictorial representation. So they were given this on the left, and they were asked to, you know, put down their own ideas. Uh, so, for example, this student talked about rain, but he also, he or she also mentioned that along with rain, sometimes you get pollutants that that uh, get delivered to Earth. And they talked a little bit about how the water would flow. And then gradually through discussion, uh, you know, teachers in front of the class, they got them to gradually formalize the model and fo focus on the water runoff problem. So eventually the, the students were you know, filling in models like this, like sort of there is three inches of rainfall and, and two inches of it gets absorbed by whatever material you have on the ground, then, then one inch is going to be the runoff. So, uh, it's clear, but what they were learning through this process is this notion of conservation of matter. So, you know, the input is equal to the uh, sum of the output. So the sum of the inputs is equal to the output, whichever, whichever way you want to look at it. And then after they had done that, they then uh, went on to build the computational model. I'll give you more details of uh, what happened in each step, but very quickly. So here is where you see the block structure modeling language. So since they're dealing with earth sciences, all of the variables that they are, you know, all of the blocks that represent variables are related to the water runoff problem. And then of course, there are these computational blocks because they're going to write conditionals. So if the rainfall exceeds the amount of uh, water that can be absorbed, then the difference is going to be the runoff. So, so there are three conditions they can think of. The amount of absorption can be greater than the rainfall. So in which case there's going to be no runoff. If, if they're equal, then again, there's going to be no runoff. But, but if the amount of rainfall exceeds the amount that can be absorbed, then there will be a runoff. So, so you know, in between, they went through this where they wrote down these three conditions as rules on paper. And then the teachers helped them build one of the conditions using this uh, uh, modeling environment. And then they, they themselves worked on the other two conditions to complete the model. And then finally, uh, once they had the model for a, for a day, they worked by themselves to, uh, to use the model to come up with some design solutions. But uh, then the teachers decided that they would then pair them up in groups of three or four 
So they could compare their individual design solutions that they had generated to each other and then try to come up with what they thought was the, the best design solution. And then they had to present it to the rest of the class uh, and, ju and justify why they thought that they had come up with a good solution. So uh, uh, this, this was the sequence that they went through. I'll, I'll go through a little more details uh, to, to sort of indicate that the data we collected from this process, and then we'll talk a little bit about the results. So just, just to, again, uh, show you the, 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 data, the information they were using. So as I mentioned, they had a choice of six materials. They were told what the absorption limit for each one was. They were told what the cost was, and they were told whether that material was, you know, was accessible, I mean, created conditions for accessibility or, or not. So, so this is what uh, the information they had. Initially, they tested with the different materials on, on the science model to see, to get results for different amounts of rainfall. So once they became familiar with that, then they went ahead and started doing their playground designs. So uh, just in more detail, there were 15 lessons. Uh, you know, uh, this, uh, the teachers covered this curriculum in about three weeks. Uh, what I haven't talked about in, in uh, much detail is that there were formative assessments that were embedded into the curriculum. And then, as you can see, this, this lays things out in more detail. So they start uh, in the first lecture of understanding uh, you know, what uh, water runoff is and what does it mean to solve a design problem. Then they went through the hands-on experience, then they spent some time building there. Uh, conceptual model talked about different materials and understood the concept of absorption. And then, uh, as I mentioned, they went through a, a rule creation process where uh, they actually wrote down rules for different conditions and whether there would be uh, whether there would be a runoff or not. Uh, we also, you know, took inspiration, for example, like the work that Chiket had done earlier. So before they got to the computational modeling process, we, we worked through a set of unplugged activities. The teacher worked through a set of unplugged activities with them. And this, this involved, you know, them rolling dice and playing a game saying that if player one rolls a dice that has this value, player two rolls a dice of this value, then player one, you know, uh, wins points based on the difference. Which, whichever player has a larger dice wins points based on the difference. So, so they were getting familiar with the notion of uh, uh, variables, writing conditionals, and, and writing out expressions. And then they went to the actual computational modeling task, which was building the model I showed you. Uh, then in between, they, they did some work on uh, understanding what fair tests were, how you compare two different situations, you know, you have to you have to have hold some things constant between these two situations in order to be able to compare them. Like you can't uh, use two different rainfalls and then compare two two materials. So so you know things like that they have to learn. And then as I mentioned, they worked on the design first individually, then in groups, and then on the final day they they put together the design the, the design solutions as slides and presented it to the rest of the class. So uh, this just again uh, shows the learning trajectories and the details of what they did in each one. Uh, I've already talked about this, so let me move on. Uh, this just shows, for example, what the uh, computational modeling environment looked like. So I showed you how they built their model but this is how they could uh, run experiments with the model that they were building. So they chose a material, they chose the amount of rainfall, and they simulated it. And, and uh, the results were, OK, this was the amount of rainfall. This is how, how much got absorbed. And this is what the runoff was. And we illustrated it to them in, in, in the form of rain tables. And in the, in the actual design process, they could then click on each one of these squares populate them with a material of their choice, right? And at any time they could say, okay, you know, uh, uh, tell me what, uh, uh, solve the, so give me the solution for the design process and uh, for a given rainfall and what they would get is the output runoff, the cost of the material 
And now we've added on, so they also told it how many of the squares that they have put in are accessible or not. So, so they get these different results. They try, they're supposed to try various combinations of materials and come to a, uh, a solution where they have minimized the runoff while keeping the cost within constraints and also meeting the accessibility constraints. So we ran a study with uh, 99 uh, students uh, in a sixth grade classroom. As I said, the curriculum was uh, run over 15 school days. This says 14. Yeah, there were 14 lessons because on the 15th day, we just presented their design solutions. Uh, these were four sections of the sixth grade classroom. They were led by two very experienced uh, science teachers, but we had gone through a four-day uh, PD career, uh, you know, exercise with them to help them sort of become familiar uh, and present a particular curriculum. We, we created extensive resources for them because they were not that used to, so, you know, in previous studies where we had, uh, that we had run in the classroom, we had gone in and set up the computational modeling environment and let students work on it. This time they were doing everything on their own, so they were somewhat nervous, and so we provide them with provided them with a lot of resources. And all the students participated in this school, the students are some uh, quite advanced. So many of them had done uh, some programming in Scratch before. So uh, students had a varying amounts of prior programming experience from almost none to some of them having done quite a bit of programming with Scratch. And, and that obviously was helpful because they were familiar with it block structure, uh, better familiar with block structure languages. So one of the primary analyses that we did uh, was, was this notion of path analysis. And we wanted to study as students went through this progression in their curriculum of doing the different units, right? What was the impact of say computational modeling, uh, you know, on, on their engineering design and then on their post-test knowledge. So we organized them so that uh, in terms of the prior knowledge, which was the pretest, the formative assessments, which we lumped together, which we could have kept them separate, but in this case, we lumped them all together. Uh, the, the, how well they did in the computational mod modeling, how well they did in the engineering design and the post knowledge. And as I, as I mentioned, we were interested in studying the relationship between the learning of the science and then their performance in the engineering design. And what role did computational thinking or computation play in this whole process? So we were interested in studying this. Path analysis is very similar to structured equation modeling for those uh, with an AI background. This is similar to you know, uh, coming up with causal relationships between uh, sets of variables. We did not try to derive the entire the structure of the causal model, the structure we used by looking at the sequence in which the students did things, but then we looked at all of the pairwise relations to, to determine which one of these relationships were had uh, you know, a high, high co correlation and whether does that correlation was significant or not. <clears throat> so data was uh, collected from the study, starting from the pre-post test, the formative assessments, the system logs of students' model building activities, and then the system logs of the students' engineering design activities. On the right, you see one of the formative assessment questions where, where students are asked to sort of discuss what the impact of putting a bias sway is where in, in between, say, a stream and, and uh, say, roads or, or, or uh, ground where there is runoff. Where bias wells are supposed to absorb the uh, uh, pollutants, so uh, so they, they studied that as a part of a formative assessment. So looking at the, the results, there were, there were a, a students had significant gains in uh, both the science, engineering, and computational thinking post-tests. Uh, as you can see, the, the p-values were, were very good. And even if you look at the, the uh, effect sizes, Right, the overall effect size uh, was quite large when you combine the results from the science engineering and CT. You just added them up and treated them as one variable. So, but but we kept them separate. So we looked at the 
pre-test scores, which were uh, an indication of prior knowledge, and post-test, of course, an indication of what they had learned through the intervention. And then uh, for computational modeling, uh, we, we looked at the logs uh, and we sort of scored their computational model in terms of the three conditions they were building, how correct that got it, right? whether they got, had, uh, had the condition right, whether they wrote the expression right, and so on and so forth. So there were six points as, uh, uh, associated with it. And when we looked at the, the uh, scores, the, the average model score was uh, 4.67 and the standard deviation of 1.15. About 60% of the students were able to get the model right on their own. And uh, so that students did work with an incorrect model for the engineering design between uh, the at the end of the computational modeling exercise and before they started the engineering design the teacher discussed the current model the correct computational model in class and encouraged the students to use that computational model in spite of that some students didn't but uh, you know there's nothing that we could do so in terms of the engineering design we we again this was uh, a, a, a somewhat uh, innovative way that we developed where we looked at three parameters or three measures to look at the quality of their designs. Of course, ultimately, the students who would have, uh, you know, uh, costs that were that were below the specified limit and satisfied the runoff constraints had, had a satisfied uh, design and met the accessibility constraints that was a satisfying design. But to make it a little easier for the sixth graders, uh, the teacher said that they should try to minimize runoff, not try to minimize the costs at the same time, but just make sure the cost did not violate the constraints that were set. So we looked at the number of uh, you know, different designs the students created and tested. The number of uh, the subset of those which were satisfying designs, in other words, in other words, it met the cost criteria and accessibility criteria. And then we were also interested in looking at how the students explored the space. So we looked at the pairwise Euclidean distance between, say, the solutions that they generated in, in terms of the tests that they did and took the mean Euclidean distance between pairs of design solutions that they generated. So we evaluated engineering design. And here you can see on the right, an interesting example of where the student generates many solutions, the lines indicate the next solution generated, the blue dots are those that are satisfied design, the red dots are those that are not, not that are that don't satisfy the constraints. And it was interesting to see the trajectory students follow. It's not a bad idea to push the limits and to generate solutions that it's just to know boundaries of, of solution are so that you can then try to optimize uh, based based on that knowledge. So again, here uh, uh, we, we came up with measures. So the average number of unique uh, designs that uh, satisfied the cost and accessibility criteria per student was about 6.3 with the standard, standard deviation. The, the, uh, the uh, standard deviation was quite large here. 89 of the 90, 99 students created and tested at least one satisfying design. So they would have reported a satisfying design. And then uh, the global minimum uh, that they could have got was a runoff of about, of about 0.96 and 29 students got this particular solution. So that, that was, was not bad. Design is a difficult task for them. and. Uh, so, uh, but but quite a few of them got it. So here we now look at the details of the path analysis. So uh, we are looking at how the how the computational module building affected performance. So we are looking at the pretest scores in engineering and computational thinking, looking at the relationship to the, the, the looking at the relationship with the formative assessments, and within the computational module building, we are looking at two parameters. How many or, or three parameters? How many how many computational tests did they run? How many edits did, did they do in building their model? And how often did they test their model? And, and uh, what impact did all these parameters have on the computational model score? 
So it's clear that, uh, for example, uh, the better they did in formative assessments, which means that they, they seem to have the knowledge of science and computation, the better models they were able to build. But the number of computational tests that they did was was closely uh, was uh, 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 inversely related to their uh, the the chunks that they tested. So those who built and tested their model in small chunks tended to do better in 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 building computational models. So so this is very much uh, the notion of uh, a strategy of building in parts rather than trying to build the whole thing and then trying to test it and correct it. So, so this was very interesting. So higher CT knowledge implied that they did more testing, more testing implied that, uh, you know, that uh, they, they had higher model scores. And then of course, the more they built the model in parts, the higher model scores that they had. Uh, similarly, uh, when we looked at the engineering design measures, what we found that uh, the more testing they, they did, right, the more satisfying uh, designs they generated, the more they explored, which means the larger was the Euclidean distance uh, of, the, of the different solutions that they generated, uh, they seem to also generate more satisfying designs. And the more satisfying designs they generated, they had lower runoff. And of course, uh, uh, the, there was a strong relationship between their ability to build good computational models in science and then being able to uh, generate a good design solution, which was uh, low runoff. So clearly established that there were strong relationships between, between the science and engineering. And then when we looked at uh, uh, the overall effects on the pre post test scores, so we also saw that uh, higher computational modeling scores implied higher, uh, you know, higher CT post test scores. So therefore, uh, the computational modeling uh, exercise did help them learn more computational constructs, which was good, right? So uh, more uh, satisfying designs they generated during the design process, the better, higher was their post-test post score in engineering. The lower runoff uh, values they were able to generate uh, was uh, closely correlated with the high, with the science post-test scores. So this was interesting. The most satisfying designs were, were correlated with the engineering post test scores, but the lower runoff they were able to generate seemed to be linked to their science post test scores. And then, of course, uh, uh, the, if they if they did a lot of random searching, the larger variety of engineering solutions they generated, uh, the, the the lower they seemed to. So this this seemed to imply that this group the, these group of students were doing more trial and error. So just to conclude, uh, I hope I've not uh, taken too much time. So I think uh, this path analysis uh, shows, and we've done a lot more analysis. I didn't want to spend a lot of time discussing this uh, in all the analyses we did, but I just wanted to show that we have been able to demonstrate the interconnectedness between science engineering and CT in an engineering, uh, in an NGSS related curriculum. Uh, so things that we would like to do uh, uh, is develop even better measures for evaluating students' model building and engineering design. Our goal is to be able to monitor students as, as they are going through their activities and sometimes provide feedback, especially for students who seem to go off track or, or get disengaged because they're frustrated they are there because they're not able to progress. So. Uh, Therefore, we want to build these adaptive scaffolding mechanisms. Another thing we want to do is also assist teachers. So, so uh, uh, Nicole Hutchins, who I mentioned early on in this talk, her PhD thesis has been very much on developing automated uh, analysis of these assessments that we give formative assessments so that the teachers can look at how students are doing in these formative assessments and also uh, uh, sort of uh, respond to students or modify their instruction in the class to, to help students overcome some of the difficulties they have. And, and one last thing that she, it, she's still in the progress of, uh, process of finishing up and she's going to defend her thesis in a couple of months. She has been taking all these analytics that we do. So one of the things I've always wondered about is, you know, uh, 
since we are computer scientists and engineers, we know how to derive a lot of analytics by looking at the data we collect from our systems. And, and sure enough, we can write good papers about them and we do, but how much are we able to impact the teachers and, and the teaching that they do in the class? So one of the challenges we've taken on is try to you know, go back to the teachers with these analytics, get them to be critical and say, this, this kind of, uh, this, the, these measures are not of interest to us. These measures would be very useful to us because if we knew that, for example, even at the end of the day, you know, I, they could then uh, tailor their instruction the next day. So they could convert some of the results they see into actionable information. So that is something that we are working on in a big way now. It's also part of the work that we are going to be doing towards this new institute for engaged learning, uh, NSF center that we have been awarded. It's led by James Nestor at NC State, but it involves North Carolina, NC State, Vanderbilt, and Indiana. Digital Promises are Nexus partners. So I'll stop right here and be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Gautam, for the fascinating uh, sharing. Uh, so we open up for questions. Uh, feel free to type on the Q&A. Uh, yeah, I cannot see the chat. So, Jikit, will you, uh, sure, will, sure. Will you yeah. sort of read out the questions to me? That I... Yeah, I think uh, so far no questions yet. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thanks for uh, sharing this fascinating curriculum in, uh, integrating science, engineering, and uh, computational modeling. So uh, a lot of richness in the curriculum, uh, and then you deploy it and collect data, and uh, you present a lot of rich analysis of the uh, what you see as the uh, interactions, the path analysis, very, very fascinating. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I looking at the participants, I was, uh, seeing that uh, teachers and uh, science center educators. So just follow up on your point on impacting the teachers. Uh, suppose they are very fascinated, interested with this work. So what can they take away to start doing something on their own? They may design some curriculum, right? Some, some real world task that tries to integrate science, engineering and modeling in the way you do. So any thoughts about, uh, you know, any design principles, uh, they can start thinking about to, to start get their feedback in trying some of this curriculum. Maybe they don't have the computational modeling integrated throughout yet, but they can, they can uh, you know, they can still have some of these activities. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is, this is a great question. And uh, uh, we have been working towards that. We have applied for new grants where we, we will, we will uh, develop tools to help the, custom, uh, the teachers customize the curriculum for their own needs. And one of the things we've thought about is, you know, these runoff problems are not the same everywhere and runoff does not occur everywhere. Um, it's more prevalent in the East Coast of the United States, but less on the West. So, but can teachers take these same ideas and then create sort of, uh, you know, uh, specific uh, curricula or specific problems that are relevant to the area that the students uh, are in. We haven't got there yet, we are working on it. But the part that we, have, we are addressing uh, through Nicole's thesis and other work is to take these uh, measures. Uh, our teachers are very interested. Uh, they always tell us that when students are working on, on the in our computer environment, the students are very engaged, but the teachers have no idea what the students are doing. So, so they are very curious to see, right, what the result of the students work is. And I know some people have tried to build these systems where you give real time feedback to what the uh, students are doing to the teachers. Our teachers don't like that. They've said they would rather have a nice summary at the end of the day so that they can use it as a reflection activity. And, prepare for them the next class. So we have created this dashboard where they can review various analytics, but the analytics are tailored to the way they, they would understand it. And then, then based on that, we, we have, we've developed an agent that can interact with teachers and suggest you know, things they might want to cover in the, in the next, you know, based on student difficulties, what they might want to cover in the next class. 
So we are in the process of building that. So. Sure, yeah, lots of promising directions. Uh, so there's a teacher for, quest, uh, for teachers. From uh, researchers, doctoral students' point of view, uh, if they're interested in this work, so what are some of the promising areas they can delve in and, and uh, do some research? I think you showed the second last slide, right? Some of the areas that you, you're talking about. You'll have to elaborate a bit more. You know, so maybe some doctoral students say, oh, this is fascinating. Where can I come in and answer some of the unanswered research questions? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so our research questions have uh, mainly revolved about around, uh, you know, this big question which which this uh, SIG is, uh, is based on, right? How do you seamlessly integrate STEM and uh, computational thinking into curricula? So a lot, lot of the questions are, are based on that. And we're trying to do this through science classrooms, mm -hmm. which, which then you know, brings up a lot of very interesting questions because not all of our science teachers are, are uh, you know, programming experts or have learned programming in the past. Now, most students who graduate now have some, some uh, background in programming, but some of our older teachers don't. So, so some of the interesting challenges uh, we are working on and, and trying to address them as research questions is, how do we how do we make this process a little easier for teachers? You know, so sometimes these curricula we develop and the systems we develop makes life harder for teachers than That's easier. Right. <laughs> so so th this is an interesting challenge. And what what we have realized is that uh, uh, to do this we need to have work with teachers, and we have started working more and more with teachers. Not not only through as professional development but to make them co-designers. Mm -hmm. so, so some of the new work that we are starting off are how to do co-design with teachers. Some of my colleagues are looking at co-design with students. So how can say high school students design curricula for middle school students? So that, that's another area we're pursuing then this dashboard and analytics, I think uh, is another interesting research area. But what I would like to say is if there are teachers in Singapore who might be interested in this curriculum or anywhere else in Asia, uh, you know, we would be glad to work with, uh, with researchers in, in, in these countries so that they can uh, try to disseminate this curriculum to, to, to their, uh, you know, to their students. Uh, of course, we've built everything in English. It might need to be translated in some countries, but but I think the ideas are quite universal. But you know, some of the problems can be changed to be more relevant to individual countries. Yeah, uh, that's that's wonderful. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I think the time is almost up. So I guess we end here. But but I think that uh, this webinar is stimulating. I think you can follow up and uh, maybe follow up on uh, Professor Piswa's invitation. Your teachers to to have some interaction a link. Uh, either directly to him or you can also email me. So, uh, okay. Uh, so that uh, I just want to use the airtime to advertise the next FC webinar. So it's on, uh, you can read the title there, it's on uh, recomp recomposition right, for shared understanding between peers and uh, between peers and teacher is by Professor Hiroshima on the 23rd of June. So uh, do, do, do participate, register for this. Yeah, okay. So it remains for me to thank Professor Biswas spending uh spending a Wednesday evening with us. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, so uh thank you very much, uh, Professor Biswas, and uh, thank you all for attending this talk. But before I forget, uh yeah, scan the QR code. Uh we'll let this slide stay on for a while and uh, provide some uh feedback uh, uh, to this survey. Yeah, so in the meantime, uh thank you all. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Chiket and others for inviting me. I enjoyed the presentation, making the presentation. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hatton. I will sign off, Chiket. Bye-bye. Talk another time. Yeah. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.